Welcome to World of History. My name is Harry LaFontaine. I'm an amateur historian and a rookie YouTube content creator. I'd like to thank everyone who's already familiar with my channel and also thank those of you who are joining us for the first time. Before we get started, I'd just like to say that starting out on YouTube from scratch without any decent equipment or experience with editing audio and or video is very challenging. However, I assure you that not only will the production quality of my videos improve steadily over time, but so will my ability to create curriculum and teach it using this platform. I hope everyone will bear with me as I grow along the way. Okay, so this is part two of two of the second lecture in the series, Constantine the Great and the Romanization of Christianity. This two-part lecture is entitled Born from Chaos, the Cradle of Constantine. In this lecture, we're learning about the so-called crisis of the third century in the Roman Empire, which took place from 235 to 284 CE. This period was absolutely chaotic, and it was also the world Constantine was born into. Our last lecture ended with the defeat and subsequent capture of Valerian by the Persians in 260 AD. I discussed some of the speculative theories regarding his life after being captured, and the one I liked the most was given to us by Muslim scholar Abu Hanifa Dinawari, in which Valerian lived out the rest of his days in relative peace, overseeing the construction of Bandi Khaizar, or Caesar's Dam, which is located in modern-day Shushtar, Iran, near the ancient city of Susa. After Valerian's capture in 260, Valerian's officers proclaimed Macrianus Minor and Quietus as co-emperors of the East, while Gallienus was still ruling in the West. It was around this time that a popular military commander named Ingenuus was proclaimed emperor by the legions of Moesia, while Gallienus was busy in Germania fighting along the Rhine River frontier. Gallienus quickly gathered legions in Gaul and rapidly marched to meet and defeat Ingenuus in battle at Mursa in modern-day Croatia. It was a general, and later a member of the so-called Thirty Tyrants, who would plague Gallienus' reign, the general Aureolus, who would defeat Ingenuus by utilizing the new and improved cavalry of the Emperor Gallienus, an innovation that he sought to implement in order to be able to better combat foreign invasions from the north and from the east. After being defeated, Ingenuus drowned himself in a river so as to avoid being captured. It was also in this same year that for the first time in the history of the empire, several large provinces in the west would split off or secede from the empire, forming an empire of their own. The so-called Gallic Empire consisted of the provinces of Hispania, Gaul, Germania, and Britannia, and the Roman military commander Marcus Posthumus was made emperor of this newfound gigantic splinter state called the Gallic Empire. Gallienus' son, Salolinus, was promptly proclaimed Augustus of the West by his legions, but this effort was too little, too late, as Posthumus would besiege and defeat Salolinus at Colonia Agrippina in modern-day Cologne, Germany. Salolinus was then executed by Posthumus' men. Meanwhile, Salolinus' father, Gallienus, was very busy having marched his legions from Gaul east into Pannonia, defeating Ingenuus, then moving north to repel invasions along the Danube frontier. So, you heard that right. There was a separate empire within what we know as the Roman Empire, beginning in 260, and it was a large empire. It was around this time that Gallienus marched from the lower Danube Pannonia area to Italy to deal with an Alemanni led coalition of barbarians that had actually reached the outskirts of Rome. This coalition force was repelled by a ragtag army of civilians formed by the Senate that were probably led by the Praetorian Guard. As they moved north, Gallienus' forces came upon them and defeated them at the Battle of Mediolanum near modern day Milan. While a portion of this coalition did manage to flee across the Alps, the Alemanni were crushed in this battle, and it would be nearly a decade before they'd be able to raise forces enough to be able to give the Empire any major problems. 260 was a very busy year, clearly, and in this same year, Regalianus, a general from Dacia, was raised to Emperor by the population and armies that were still reeling from the loss of Ingenuus. These populations were situated along the Lower Danube and were directly threatened by the Sarmatians, 
a people originally from the steppe lands to the northeast of the Danube frontier. The Sarmatians were closely related to the fearsome Scythians. Regalianus is said to have opposed the encroaching Sarmatians strongly, but in the end, he was ultimately killed by his own people. Surprise, surprise. Meanwhile, to the east in Palmyra, which was a self-governing Roman province in Syria, their local prince, Odonathus, who was a Roman citizen of consular rank, moved against Sharpur's Persian army as it was on its way back home with Valerian after defeating the Roman forces at Antioch. Odonathus would defeat Sharpur's forces and then would also defeat the would-be Roman usurper Quietus at Emesa in Syria. As a reward, Gallienus would name Odonathus Corrector Totius Orientis, or Governor of All the East, a move that would have made Niccolo Machiavelli cringe, and a move that would cause a lot more harm than good. Machiavelli strongly advises against rewarding your rivals or even your potential rival rivals with any increased power, authority, or prestige, and over the next several years, the Palmyrenes would prove Machiavelli correct. Upon receiving this title, Odonathus would name himself King of Palmyra and ultimately, later on, would name himself King of Kings, but more on that later. In 261, Aureolus, Gallienus' new cavalry commander, with their new and improved cavalry, would defeat both Macrianus Major and Macrianus Minor in battle somewhere in the Balkans. These rebel forces would have consisted of the soldiers of the Danubian provinces that had created the recent usurpation attempts by Ingenuus and Regalianus and would have been a very large army consisting of as many as 30,000 men. In entrusting Aureolus with the command of such a large force, Gallienus was making yet another Machiavellian no-no in that Aureolus' power and prestige was growing unchecked. It was in this same year of 261 that Valens Thessalonicus and Piso were proclaimed emperors for about five minutes. Piso killed Valens and then was killed by his own men. Surprise. It was also in the year 261 that Christianity was recognized as a legal religion in the Roman Empire for the first time ever. There are several potential reasons for this, all of which we will discuss in a future lecture. Anyway, sometime around the end of 261 or beginning of 262, the prefect of Egypt, Mucius Emilianus, and his advisor or counterpart in some capacity or another, Nemor, were both defeated and killed by Aureolus under orders from Gallienus. Things were relatively quiet on the crisis front over the next several years in terms of usurpers, uprisings, and the like. In 265, Gallienus' army suffered a defeat at the hands of the army of Posthumus in Gaul. No one noteworthy was killed or captured in this defeat. In 266, Odonathus declared himself king of kings and invaded Persia. In 267, Odonathus was assassinated and his son, Vibalathus, was named King of Palmyra with Zenobia, the late king's wife, and the mother of Vibalathus, becoming regent as Vibalathus, was just a boy of probably seven or eight years old at the time that his father died. There are several conspiracies surrounding the death of Odonathus, many of which accuse a cousin or possibly a nephew of the crime. The conspiracy I like the most accuses a nephew of Odonathus of killing him and his oldest son, Herodianus, after the nephew had his horse taken from him, uh, which was considered to be highly insulting, and was then placed in shackles as punishment for disobeying orders during a lion hunt. Odonathus' son, Herodianus, requested that his father forgive the boy his transgressions, which he did, only for the both of them to be murdered by the nephew, who in turn was immediately executed by the royal bodyguard. Sounds awfully fishy to me. Around the time all of this was going on, the Goths would enlist the naval assistance of the Heruli, a Germanic tribe that lived north of the Black Sea near the Sea of Azov. Together, they would launch multiple invasions into the empire. This coalition would ransack several areas along the coasts of Thrace, Macedonia, and Greece, even reaching as far south as Crete. Another invasion force crossed the Danube, carrying out vicious attacks in Moesia Superior and Moesia Inferior, while at the same time deploying forces into Pannonia. This was a major offensive that was definitely a serious threat to the survival of the heartland of the Roman East. Gallienus' forces would win several important victories versus this coalition in 267 and 268. 
There are several sources that describe the details of these events, so it's definitely a challenge trying to present a clear picture of what all took place. I'll sum this up quickly by saying that after winning several important battles, Gallienus had to leave an officer named Lucius Marcianus in charge and march for Italy, where that boldly empowered and now former cavalry commander Aureolus had revolted, challenging Gallienus' authority. Of course he did. This came as a total surprise to Gallienus, who had left Aureolus in Milan to maintain surveillance on Postumus of the Gallic Empire. Well, as it turns out, Aureolus and Postumus may have conspired together to draw Gallienus in, even though Postumus seems to have actually bailed on Aureolus. Either way, it worked, and upon his arrival, Gallienus defeated Aureolus, who had found himself without the support of Postumus, uh, in battle outside of Milan, and as he prepared to besiege Milan, where Aureolus had fled to and holed himself up, Gallienus was assassinated by his own officers. Of course he was. Knowing him, he probably had all kinds of ill-advised power plays going on all around him. That is, if you've paid any attention to Machiavelli's philosophies, and all of this strikes you the same way it strikes me. Again, sources differ on who actually did the conspiring and the killing, but I'd say it was most likely a group effort, and that even if Claudius and Aurelian, who would come to power one after the other, didn't participate directly in any conspiring or killing themselves, they at least knew about it and chose to keep their mouths shut. It was at this time that Claudius II was named emperor, and in 269 he dealt the Goths a crushing defeat at the Battle of Nisus. Well, Probably Aurelian was the one doing the actual crushing, and he probably was directly assisted in this endeavor by a high-ranking officer of his own in one Constantius Chlorus. Oh, did I mention that Constantine was the son of Constantius Chlorus and would be born in this war-torn city of Nisus about three years later, in February of 272? And now that we've jumped forward just a little bit, it's time we take a brief look in the rearview mirror and talk about the gross debasement of the Roman currency that took place during the reign of Gallienus. For all he did that was out of the ordinary for this period in time, mainly just staying alive and in charge for 15 years from 253 to 268, Gallienus did something else that was even more out of the ordinary in that he systematically reduced the amount of silver in the coinage so as to be able to finance his huge military expenditures. This was not an uncommon practice and it's still not an unco uncommon practice today, but the way Gallienus went about it was he... he reduced the amount of silver in the coinage drastically and rapidly, and he never realized the, the profoundly horrific effect this would have on the Roman economy until it was way too late, if he ever even recognized what was happening at all. This debasement of currency caused rapid and massive inflation, not to mention driving the black market to all new heights in cities all throughout the empire. Think about it like this. Imagine going to your favorite grocery store just to buy the gallon of milk and loaf of bread that usually runs you about five bucks, but then when you get to the register and the cashier sees that your cash is Gallienus cash, the cashier then tells you that if you're paying in Gallienus money that your gallon of milk and loaf of bread that's normally five bucks is going to cost you 500. That's how severe Gallienus' debasement of the Roman currency was and it would be decades through the economic reforms of both Diocletian and Constantine before the economic situation returned to any sense of normalcy. And even then, the West would never really compete with the East again in terms of wealth generated and economic stability. All right then, so where were we? We've got Claudius II in Rome, we've got Marcus Posthumus in the Gallic Empire, and we've got Queen Regent Zenobia in the East, governing Palmyra ever so ambitiously. In a surprising show of benevolence, Claudius would see to it that his predecessor, Gallienus, be deified by the Senate and people of Rome, although this would only take place after several of Gallienus' family members were murdered upon the people receiving the news of his assassination, followed by the ascension of Claudius. It was in 269 CE, that our overly ambitious and emboldened and also embittered old friend Aureolus was dealt with by Claudius, either just prior to the Battle of Nisus or just afterwards, as he was killed by the besieging army, even after attempting to just surrender and be done with it. Meanwhile, Postumus and Zenobia were also keeping themselves busy in 269, in the west and in the east, respectively. 
It was in 269 that a Gallic military commander named Laelianus would proclaim himself emperor of the Gallic Empire, only to be quickly disposed of by Posthumus, who was then quickly disposed of mutinously, only for his ill-fated successor, Marius, to be disposed of mutinously by Victorinus, who was the commander of the Gallic Empire's version of the Praetorian Guard. Marius held power for no more than a couple of months, although some sources proclaim that he was in power for nothing more than a couple of days, and so another one of the so-called Thirty Tyrants was laid to rest. While all of this was going on, Claudius had given himself the title of Gothicus Maximus, based on his devastation of the Goths at the Battle of Nisus, a devastation so severe that it would be about a century before the Goths would be able to again pose a serious threat against the Empire. So, Claudius Gothicus, or more aptly, Claudius the Destroyer of the Goths, campaigned against the invading Alemanni who had crossed the Alps into northern Italy. He quickly routed them at the Battle of Lake Benicus and was rewarded with the title of Germanicus Maximus, just before setting his sights on that ever so pesky splinter empire to the west, the Gallic Empire, which was now under the command of Victorinus, who had ultimately become the true successor of Posthumus. Claudius managed to seize control of Hispania, restoring the very wealthy province to imperial rule, just as the Vandals decided they would have a go at plundering Pannonia, just south of the Danube. As Claudius prepared to deal with the invading barbarians, wouldn't you know it, he contracted the Cyprian Plague and died in January of 270. In typical crisis of the 3rd century fashion, the Senate chose to proclaim Claudius' brother Quintilius as emperor while the army chose to promote their own commander, Aurelian, to the highest seat in the land. And speaking of the highest seat in the land, it was right around this time that Queen Regent Zenobia sought to increase the elevation of her own seat by capturing Egypt and territories in Anatolia and in the Levant. She dressed all of this up as if she were exercising her late husband's authority, acting on behalf of the Roman Emperor. Well, as it turns out, she had a bit of an agenda, and if I was a betting man, I'd bet that those titles that were bestowed upon her late husband, King Odonathus, King of Kings Odonathus, Clarissimus Constiliaris, or basically of consular rank Odonathus, Corrector Todius Orientis, or Governor of all the East Odonathus. You get the picture. Probably had something to do with the formation of an ego that was overblown enough to try to pull such a ploy off. And I'm not referring directly to her ego and her ego alone, but rather I am referring to the general overall ego of everyone involved, ranging from the queen herself all the way down to the lowliest of her supporters. These events are the very blueprint of what Machiavelli teaches against in his masterwork, The Prince. As all of this Zenobia-led Palmyrene funny business was taking place in the East, Quintilius was either vanquishing himself being vanquished by his own men, or being vanquished by Aurelian. Regardless of who or what was responsible for the vanquishing of Quintilius, Quintilius was vanquished. There's even a little bit of a rumor out there that Quintilius vanquished himself with assistance in the form of an assisted suicide. Regardless of what happened with Quintilius, Aurelian was in charge now, and boy was he ever. In an immediate attempt to thwart Aurelian before he could even get started, Zenobia seceded from the empire and ended the much-needed grain shipments from Egypt to the city of Rome, and the Palmyrene Empire was born. If we take a look at this map, we can see exactly what Aurelian was facing heading into this thing, and if we've learned anything about the crisis of the 3rd century, there's no way this could go well for the empire, right? Wrong. Aurelian was exactly what the Roman Empire needed at the exact time it needed it most. You've got powerful splinter state empires in both the East and the West. You've got multiple militarized hordes of barbarians threatening provinces along the Danube frontier and even posing a direct threat to Italy and Rome itself. You're in the midst of a financial crisis, the likes of which the world had never seen before, let alone the Roman Empire itself. And you've got Aurelian, a career military man of modest origins who'd been thrust into power by the army just like almost every other bozo who'd come along in the last 35 years. Except Aurelian was no bozo. He immediately took steps to address the ongoing economic meltdown by seizing control of the imperial mint in Sicia in the Pannonian province northeast of Italy in modern-day Croatia. In doing so, he struck gold coins that he would distribute as a donative to the military, ensuring their loyalty. This would have had a profound effect 
on his men as for the past 10 to 15 years, the debasement of the currency probably did little more than insult the men who were out there putting their lives on the line for the emperor. From there, Aurelian marched his forces toward Rome, knowing that he'd encounter the barbarian raiders, the Yithungi, along the way. They were slowly en route home, bearing the weight of the spoils they'd acquired in their raids into Italy. In a power play, Aurelian halted them, seized their newfound wealth, and in agreeing to allow for them to return home, forced them to contribute as many as 100,000 soldiers, including cavalrymen, to his own forces. Aurelian turned his attention back to Pannonia at this time, driving the Vandals back across the Danube and further increasing his own army's fighting strength by acquiring more cavalrymen from the Vandals in exchange for food enough for them to be able to see the bulk of their forces return home without starving to death. Now Aurelian would finally travel in full force to Rome, where he would cement his reputation that he was not one to be trifled with. He quickly suppressed a revolt that was led by the workers who ran the imperial mint in the city. Smells like a preemptive attempt to mask corruption at the mint in Rome, if you ask me. It seems as though Aurelian caught a whiff of that same scent as he would proceed to shut that mint down in Rome, the capital, the home of the ever so upright and uptight senate. Meanwhile, in the Gallic Empire, Gallic Emperor Victorinus was busy seducing the wife of one of his own officers, an officer named Atidianus. Atidianus promptly murdered Victorinus, whose mother, Victoria, was wealthy enough to arrange for the deification of her home-wrecking son and also buy enough time to have Tetricus I appointed as her son's successor. Tetricus had been the provincial governor of Gallia Aquitania, a region in the southwest of modern-day France. Back in Rome, there were a couple of possible usurpation flare-ups that were immediately found out and stamped out, and in 271, Aurelian would cancel all debts to the Roman treasury. He hosted a huge public bonfire in the city where all records relevant to these debts were destroyed in the fire. Aurelian was for real. He was so for real, in fact, that no sooner than did the Senate choose to support him did a multi-pronged barbarian invasion force consisting of the Yathungi, Alamane, and Marcomanni attempt to invade Italy. At the outset, the Romans suffered a major defeat in a surprise attack in northern Italy. In retaliation, Aurelian led his forces to multiple victories against these invaders, but their guerrilla fighting tactics proved to be enough to prevent Roman forces from stamping them out completely, although Aurelian was able to buy time enough to enhance the defenses of the city of Rome itself. The citizens of Rome were terrified that the city was practically defenseless against any future raiding, pillaging, plundering, you name it, and they weren't wrong. Nothing had been done to shore up the city's defenses in terms of walls and the like in hundreds of years. The old Servian walls that were constructed in the 4th century BC E weren't even close to adequate enough to provide defense for a city that had already outgrown them 300 years prior to Aurelian. Aurelian would confer with the Senate and together, they would commission the construction of an entirely new set of defensive walls and towers that would alleviate the city's vulnerability against any potential incursions, settling the unrest deeply rooted in its population. As 271 AD marched on, so did Aurelian, as he led his forces into the Balkans, defeating the invading Goths and killing their leader, Cannabautis. In a stunning, almost Hadrian-esque move, Aurelian organized the abandonment of the Roman province of Dacia, which was the only province the empire held that was on the northern side of the Danube River. In doing so, he resettled the evacuees in his new province of Dacia Aureliana, which was south of the Danube and comprised of lands formerly of the Moetian provinces. As the sun rose on 272 CE, Aurelian set his sights on the reclamation of Rome's eastern provinces that were now being governed by the upstart Palmyrene Empire and their emboldened queen, Zenobia. As Aurelian led his forces through Anatolia towards the Levant, he was met with little resistance as he had instituted a policy of clemency towards all cities that accepted being reincorporated into the Roman Empire. As word of this clemency spread, cities didn't resist at all, opening their gates to the newfound benevolence of the Roman Emperor instead. As Aurelian and his forces entered into the northern Levant, his peaceful victories would become military victories as he defeated the Palmyrenes in the battle at Emme and then at the decisive battle of Emesa. While all of this was taking place, Marcus Probus regained Egypt from Palmyra, restoring Roman access to much-needed grain shipments, not only for the city of Rome, but for Aurelian's army as well. 
With Egypt recaptured and the Aurelian-led devastation of the Palmyrene forces complete, Zenobia would be left with no other choice other than to retreat back to her own capital city of Palmyra and prepare to be besieged. In her haste, she left the royal Palmyrene treasury behind in Amasa, where it was recovered by the Romans. Aurelian and his forces would lay siege to Zenobia's Palmyrene capital city of Palmyra in the summer of 272. It's said that Aurelian was somewhat badly wounded, maybe by an arrow, by local Bedouins loyal to the Palmyrenes while he and his forces were on their way to Palmyra. Nonetheless, the local Bedouins would ultimately betray the queen in that they decided to provide Aurelian's forces with much needed food and water in the scorching summer heat of the desert lands in Syria surrounding the Palmyrene capital. It wouldn't be long before Zenobia decided that she and her son would try to escape and flee to the east in an attempt to enlist the aid of the Sassanid Persians. They wouldn't make it very far before they were captured by Roman forces as they tried to figure out a way to cross the mighty Euphrates River. With Zenobia and Babalathus in tow, Aurelian and his forces would begin their march back to the west. Throughout his time as emperor, Aurelian made an effort to unite the citizens of his empire under a single supreme deity, Sol Invictus or the Unconquered Son. This was by no means a new concept, but he really made an effort to propagate this religious practice, and that effort can be seen in his coinage and in his temple dedication to Sol Invictus in Rome, which he dedicated on December 25th, 274. Anyway, back to what I was saying. Late in 272, while en route to the west, something unprecedented would take place as Aurelian and his forces, which would have included a high-ranking officer by the name of Constantius Chlorus, were passing through Antioch. It was at this moment that for the first time in the history of the empire and the history of the church, respectively, that the Roman emperor would be asked by Christians to intervene in a matter of the Christian church. Aurelian himself, for what it's worth, was not a Christian and had little interest in the church's disputes. All he was interested in at this time was restoring order in the east and continuing forward with his attempt to reunify his empire. From here, Aurelian would march west towards Italy, only to encounter an invasion force of Carpi somewhere along the banks of the Danube. He and his forces defeated and repelled the Carpi just in time for revolts to break out in the city of Palmyra and in the province of Egypt. So back east they went, crushing the revolt in Palmyra, and this time around there would be no clemency, as Aurelian allowed his forces to sack and destroy the famed city. It would never recover. Afterwards, Aurelian quickly handled the revolt in Egypt, and it's possible that a portion of the Library of Alexandria was destroyed by the fire during the suppression of this revolt, but I can't say for sure. Aurelian's forces would finally arrive in the west to confront Tetricus's rebel Gallic state's forces in 274. At this time, Tetricus was having plenty of problems already in that he was dealing with invading Germanic tribes along the Rhine and internal rebellions and conspiracies, all of which threatened to bring him down. When Roman forces and Gallic Empire forces met on the battlefield at Chalon in 274, one of two things took place. Either Tetricus was so severely outmatched that he was quickly captured in battle, or there were arrangements made between him and Aurelian beforehand that would see Tetricus defect to Aurelian and the Romans. Either way, the legions that had been stationed along the Rhine frontier were massacred, and this would make it very difficult for the Romans to defend their newly regained provinces against the multitudes of Germanic invaders who would have certainly smelled the blood in the water. With the empire finally reunified under one sole emperor, Aurelian had achieved a level of greatness unseen in the empire since the likes of the five good emperors, a full century prior. With these great achievements, Aurelian was awarded with the title Restigitor Orbis, or Restorer of the World to go along with many other titles that he'd earned along the way. He also organized a massive triumph in the city of Rome that featured Tetricus of the defeated Gallic Empire and Zenobia of the defeated Palmyrene Empire. It is said that both of these defeated foes were treated with respect by their conqueror and allowed to live out the rest of their lives in peace in Italy. After all the victory dust settled, in 275, Aurelian prepared his forces for a campaign against the Persians in the east. They were currently struggling with their own succession crisis at this time because their powerful king, Sharpur, had died a year or two prior to the reunification of the Roman Empire. Aurelian sought to take advantage of this instability, but wouldn't you know it, Aurelian would never cross back into Asia, but instead, of course, he was assassinated by his own officers.
The general consensus is that his own secretary, for fear of being punished by Aurelian for being corrupt, did something corrupt. He created a document with the Emperor's forged signature on it that listed the names of several officers that the Emperor was supposedly going to have killed. He presented this bogus document to officers close to Aurelian who were listed on the document, who of course did the unthinkable and cut their Emperor down. It wouldn't be long before the treachery of Aurelian's secretary would be revealed and his own execution was soon to follow. As word of this treachery spread throughout the Empire, the people and the legions of Rome would grieve the loss of the man who was strong enough and skilled enough to save the mighty Empire from her own weakness, corruption, and deceit. The Senate, or possibly Aurelian's widow, Ulpia Severina, or possibly both, managed imperial affairs for the next few months until Tacitus was recognized as Emperor around the end of 275, beginning of 276. Tacitus was busy throughout the few months he was Emperor. He's said to have had Aurelian deified, said to have had his murderers executed, and also said to have defeated raiding parties in Anatolia. Raiding parties that most likely consisted of mercenary forces previously loyal to Aurelian. He also appointed Probus as governor of the eastern provinces. Then he got sick and died. The western provinces declared Florianus emperor, while the eastern provinces declared their newly appointed governor Probus emperor. Florianus was the Praetorian Prefect and the half-brother of Tacitus. He also had the support of the Senate as he marched east to confront Probus, who was a seasoned military commander and was successful during the reigns of Aurelian and Tacitus. Utilizing his military prowess, Probus's strategies eroded the morale and the will of the forces led into Asia Minor by Florianus and in late 276, Florianus was killed by his own men, leaving Probus as the sole ruler of the Empire. After being ratified as emperor by the Senate in early 277, Probus would be successful in repelling several barbarian invasions from the Rhine frontier to the Danube frontier and even in Anatolia from 277 to 279. In 280 and 281, Probus eliminated a handful of would-be usurpers and won another victory or two against foreign invaders and he decided he'd have a triumph of his own in Rome. In 282, while campaigning in the east, Probus, who had proven to be an effective emperor, was killed by his own men. An officer named Carus was named emperor by these rebels who eliminated Probus, only for Carus to turn the tables on the very men who paved his imperial path, ordering them all to be executed. And just when we thought things were starting to get back to normal. Carus named his sons Carinus and Numerian as his Caesars, and in 283, while Carinus fought Germanic tribes along the Rhine, Carus and Numerian won battles against the Persians in the east. Then Carus randomly died and his sons were accepted as co-emperors. In 284, Sabinus Julianus declared himself emperor. Then, much like his father, Numerian randomly died while he was on his way to confront this usurper, Sabinus Julianus. Immediately following the death of Numerian, two men named Diocles and Aper struggled for control over the sudden vacancy left by Numerian. Diocles blamed Aper for the death of Numerian and killed him or had him executed. Diocles was proclaimed emperor at this time and changed his name to Diocletian. In 285, Carinus defeated the usurper Sabinus Julianus in Italy. Soon after, Diocletian arrived with his forces from the east and defeated Carinus and finally, the so aptly named Crisis of the 3rd Century in Rome came to a close. Diocletian, unlike so many of his predecessors, will be sticking around for quite a while, and we will get to know him, the Tetrarchy, his persecutions, and more, all rather well, in our next lecture. If you like this video, please give it a like and a comment, and even if you didn't like it, let me know what I can do better. If you haven't already, please subscribe. This has been a World of History production. My name is Harry LaFontaine, and I will see you next time.